Hi, everybody. And thanks so much for coming. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Elsa Pancharoli, Dr. Dr. Elsa, you can call me. Um, and I am originally from Scotland, but I'm, at the moment I'm working down in Oxford at the Natural History Museum in the University of Oxford. So I am a scientist and a researcher, and I study fossils. Now, I actually, I do study some dinosaurs, but I actually study a lot of other animals as well. So in the same time as we had dinosaurs back in the Jurassic, we also have lots of other animals beginning to evolve and turning to the kind of animals we see today. So things like uh, small reptiles, like lizards, um, salamanders, so those are things like newts and frogs, but also, and I'm particularly interested in mammals, so that's the, the group that we belong to, the, uh, with fur and warm blood that give milk to their babies. So I study where all these animals come from, how they lived, what their skeletons looked like, um, and basically how they turned into the animals that we know today through the process of evolution. So that's what I spend my time doing is researching um, and I find a lot of fossils with my teammates on the Isle of Skye and also the Isle of Egg in Scotland. But I also work with a few other people in other parts of Scotland, including places like Elgin um, and Edinburgh, um, on different fossils from different time periods, including much, much older ones as well. Uh, yeah, so that's what I kind of do. I use a lot of x-ray uh, technology, so x-rays that can see through rock and see through bone and look at the, the structure of bones and the anatomy, you know, how what they look like and how they're put together. Um, so I do an awful lot of these scans, what are called CT scans, to get this kind of information. Um, and basically I use it to put these fossils back together. So obviously, you know, you find a fossil and sometimes it's in lots of bits, so it's broken, and you can scan it and you can put it back together like a jigsaw puzzle. And once you've done that, you can study this animal, you know, these animals and how they lived um, in their environment alongside the dinosaurs. So, yeah, that's what I do. Um, and if I thought basically today, if you've got sort of any questions either about the animals themselves or about being, how to be, what is, you know, I'm a paleontologist, so I study fossils, how to become one um, and what I do, any questions you have at all, uh, you can just ask me today. What's the most uh, so, interesting thing you found on, on Sky then? Because I think we all know where Sky is. So, oh, yeah, well, I should say, so Sky, some of you have probably been there. Sky's like a, a, a really beautiful big island on the west coast of Scotland. And it has really cool rocks, like really amazing sort of pointy rocks and stuff that was actually, they were actually come from volcanoes that erupted on the Isle of Sky and along the whole of the west coast of Scotland um, about 55 million years ago. But underneath, those volcanic rocks, that's where we find our fossils. And of course, they're much, much older. They're from the Jurassic. So that's about 165 million years ago. So a lot, lot longer. Um, and we find all different kinds of fossils. What is, what's the most exciting one I've found? See, the thing is, I get really excited about odd things. So I get excited about really tiny fossils that are very, very difficult to see because they're so small and you have to crawl around on your hands and knees using like a tiny magnifying glass to find them. Um, so one of my favorite things was the first year that I went there and I was just being taught how to find fossils, um, which is actually quite, can be quite difficult to find them. Um, and I saw this, this black, tiny black blob and I, I thought that looks like a tiny little fossil. And I told my teammates and they said, no, 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 we've looked at it already, it's not a fossil. I had a second look and I looked really, really closely and it had tiny little teeth in it. Cool. And it turned out it wasn't just a fossil, it was actually like a whole tiny little skeleton of a lizard just sitting in the rock and its skull was what was coming out of the rock that I could see. Um, and that was really exciting and we're just working on that at the moment and hopefully we'll be able to share it with everyone in the next year or two. So I think that's one of my favourite things. And I think I liked it, especially because everybody else said that it wasn't a fossil. But um, <laughs> I stuck to my guns. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> really awesome. So do you know what kind of lizard it's come from then? Or, or is that what you have to find out? We do now know what kind of lizard. Um, and it's a really, really early member of, of like the kind of lizards you see today. But they only have, of course, have just appeared at that time alongside the dinosaurs. So it's quite important for us to understand how they, they became the lizards that they are today. So, yeah. Okay, we've got a question for you. Which dinosaur fossils have you studied? Okay, 
Well, uh, most recently, you might have seen on the news, I found a dinosaur fossil on the Isle of Egg. Um, so that's a much smaller island that's just south of the Isle of Skye. Um, and I was there with, again, with lots of my colleagues, because, of course, I don't just look for fossils on my own. We all work as a team looking for them. Um, and I was walking along the shoreline and I ended up quite far away from all the rest of my colleagues, all the rest of my teammates. So I thought, well, I better get back. So I turned around and I started like running along the shore and I was jumping from rock to rock, you know. Um, and suddenly I thought, hang on a minute. I just stepped on something that looked really big and black. And I turned around and walked back and it was um, a huge big fossil bone. And it turned out, I got all my teammates to come and have a look and we all agreed that this was too big to be anything except a dinosaur. So we managed to cut it out of the rock and take it back to the laboratory um, and study it. And it is actually the leg bone of a stegosaur-like dinosaur. So it wasn't stegosaurus itself, but probably a close relative, a cousin. Um, and it would have been quite big, so the size of a car. Um, and it lived on the Isle of Egg 165 million years ago. Um, and it looks like from studying the bone, it was quite a young animal. So it maybe, maybe it was doing something like trying to cross a river or something like that. And it just didn't make it to the other side and got swept out uh, to sea. So yeah, I studied that with my friends. My, I have friends who are much, much more experts on dinosaurs than I am. So we studied it together. Is that the biggest fossil that you've ever found? Fetter Cairn would like to know this. Um, is it the biggest one? Yeah, I think it's the biggest single bone. So it was about as long as my arm. So if I hold my arm out, it was from like my fingertip to my elbow. So yeah, it's, it's quite long. And that's just one bone, of course, which is from the lower part of your leg. So if you if you look at your own leg, of course, you've got your large thigh bone at the top. And then you've got two smaller bones at the bottom half of your leg. So it was one of those bones on the bottom half. So yeah, that single bone is just one part of this, this enormous dinosaur. So that's probably, yeah, it's the biggest thing because most of the stuff I look for is quite small. Yeah, very exciting to find something big. <laughs> um, what is the coolest thing you've studied then? Ooh, the coolest thing. That's a difficult question. I guess, it. again, it always depends what you find exciting, doesn't it? That was pretty cool finding that dinosaur. And I think one of the things that made it really cool was that the bone itself was really battered and really kind of, it didn't look very nice, you know? Like if you think of films like Jurassic Park, you know, they're looking for bones and they sort of find them complete and they look very new and very sort of obviously bones. But of course, fossils don't tend to look like that when we find them, they tend to look messy. Um, bits of them have been nibbled off and part of it's been, you know, eroded by the sea, you know, worn away by the sea. So to, to make sure that we, it was definitely a dinosaur and to figure out what kind of dinosaur it was, we had to do lots of other analyses and lots of other uh, ways of studying it. So one of the things we did was we actually cut a slice through the bone and we looked at what we call the microstructure. So that's basically the, the way that the bone is put together inside. So it kind of looks a bit like a honeycomb, you know, if you were to, if you were to break open a bit of honeycomb or an arrow, something like an arrow. Um, and the pattern of the, the like, tiny little lines and bubbles and holes and things in the bone, it tells us an awful lot about an animal. So it was pretty cool studying that because I learned so much from my, from my friends about how to do that, how to cut up these bones and how to study them and what the patterns inside the bones tell us. And they told us that this was a really young animal, so it was glowing really fast. Because when you grow fast, you, you lay down bone in a different, you, you know, your bones grow differently. Um, and it told us that it was a very young animal because bones also have like lines inside them. A bit like if you cut a tree stump and you get tree rings, bones have similar kind of lines inside them. So this only had like one or two lines, so it was only a very young animal. So it, yeah, it was, it was probably one of the coolest things getting to study that bone and study the inside of it. Cool. Um, how many species of dinosaur were there in the world or in Scotland? Oh, heaps. <laughs> oh, wow. Heaps, yeah. <laughs> well, then, that's a hard one to answer because also we've not found all of them, of course. So in Scotland, we don't actually have very many dinosaurs that, are, that have got proper names. So if you're going to name a dinosaur, you don't just have to find a bone. You have to find a bone that you can definitely tell what kind of species it is. 
and usually we tell that by the shape of the bone you know it has like a knobble in one place and not in another or something like that um, and we call those diagnostic features and that means basically they let us say that this bone is definitely you know tyrannosaurus rex and it's not another type of tyrannosaurus for example um, but the bones we find in Scotland, because they tend to be quite broken and worn down, we don't have those, those features preserved. So we can't actually tell what species they are. We can only say that it's maybe a, you know, a stegosaur-like dinosaur or it's a sauropod-like dinosaur. So in Scotland, you, you know, probably there are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of species of dinosaurs, but we just don't know because we can't tell from the bones that we find. But looking around the whole world, whoa, there's hundreds and hundreds of species. I actually don't know off the top of my head how many there are in total, but I would imagine that there must be a, a sort of good thousand known to science. Um, but every week, somebody finds a new fossil of a dinosaur and names it. So uh, the number's going up all the time. Cool. Um, what type of tools do you use? Because I imagine well, getting bones out of the rocks must be quite tricky. Like. Yeah, that's a really good question, actually, because uh, you use different tools, of course, at different points in the job. So to begin with, you know, when we're finding fossils, um, yeah, we're, we use rock saws to cut the bones out of the rock. Uh, in other parts of the world, you don't need to use a saw because the rock is softer, but the rocks on Sky are really, really hard. Um, but we also use things like um, eye lenses. So these are tiny little magnifying lenses that let us look at very small fossils. And then once we, of course, have the fossils and we take them back to the lab, um, we've got people who use uh, tools to remove the rock around the fossil. And then one of the tools that I use a lot is, um, some, is X-ray scanning, like I was saying at the start. So we do that using a, a kind of an X-ray scanning machine, which looks a bit like a kind of giant microwave. Or if um, I have to get really, really detailed scans, I'll take it to a place called a uh, synchrotron, um, and it is um, a really sort of big building that produces such powerful x-rays. Um, in fact, they're so powerful, you could use them to look at bacteria. You, know, you can see tiny, tiny things. So I'll use that to get scans of bones. And they let me not only look at the bones, but look inside the bone at like things like I was talking about earlier, these structures like the rings of growth inside bones and teeth. So it's a really important tool in my work. Um, and of course, the number one tool for any paleontologist is a computer. <laughs> we all use, we're sitting at our computers an awful lot of the time. I guess we can imagine that you're just out digging up rocks or in a field somewhere, you know, like a, a bit like an archaeologist, but you still get to data, I suppose, and take it back to a lab and examine it and all that kind of things. Um, totally, yeah. Somebody's asking, how long did you have to study to do your job? Well, quite a long time, um, but you it's funny, you know, you start doing the job while you're still studying. So you get to start doing these really fun things quite early on. So I went to university first um, and I did a degree. So that's like four years. Um, and then I had to go and do a second degree, which is called a master's. But when you're doing that degree, you, that's when you start already studying fossils. So you get to handle them and you get to, you know, to basically understand them and start doing like analysis and things. And then I had to do a third degree, uh, which is a PhD. And that's what makes you a doctor is when you do a PhD. Um, but the whole of your PhD, you're already working with fossils. So although you're still studying, you're also getting to do the job at the same time, a bit like an internship or something like that. Um, so although I had to do a lot of different degrees and a lot of study, it meant that I could work on fossils at the same time. So it's, it's quite good fun. And somebody else is asking, what was the first thing you ever found? Or is that the lizard one you spoke about? Or Well, no, because I found stuff, of course, before I was a paleontologist, before I was a scientist. Okay. Um, the first one I think I ever found myself, well, that's a really good question. Hmm, let me think for a second. I think... The first one was actually on the Isle of Skye, but it was years and years ago because um, there's good beaches on Skye where you can uh, walk along the beach and look for fossils. Um, and some of these beaches, you know, you, you, some of them are protected and you're not allowed to take any fossils, but other ones 
if you are allowed to go and look. Um, and I found an ammonite, which I'm sure a lot of you will know. And it's these these ones that are like a spiral shell. Um, but it wasn't a big one. I was doing that, but it was a tiny, tiny little one. It was so small, it kind of just sat on the tip of my finger. Um, and it also wasn't made of hard rock. It was made of like a really soft kind of clay. So it meant that after I found it, it started to rain and the rain just dissolved it and it disappeared. And I think Oh, just, that's a shame. Oh, well, it's kind of, it's a shame, but it's also kind of amazing to think that it survives for like 160 million years and then there's a rain, a rainfall and it just, it just melts. So not all fossils are preserved hard. You know, some of them are, are soft and can just disappear just like that. Oh, I think that's really sad. <laughs> oh no, I think it's kind of beautiful. <laughs> Very frustrating though, if you've just found it and it rains on you, because let's face uh, well, it, it will rain a lot in the sky. So. I took a photograph though. So. Well, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Um, Catherine is asking, how did the dinosaurs become extinct? Oh, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. So that is something that scientists have been studying for a long time, because of course, when they looked at rocks and they see these big giant, you know, reptiles, and then suddenly nothing, they all disappear. Um, now we are pretty sure we know the answer now. Um, and that is that 66 million years ago, um, of course, there were lots and lots of dinosaurs. It was what we call the dinosaur heyday. It was, you know, uh, uh, you know, they were doing really, really well, but then this, this asteroid, this comet, fell from space. Now, this thing was about the size of, if you imagine, like, um, mountains. Okay, imagine that the Cairngorms, which are not far from Aberdeen, imagine that the whole of the Cairngorms just fell out of the sky and landed on the Earth. So, I mean, this was a huge, huge rock. Um, and it landed near Mexico. And it caused, first of all, of course, a huge explosion. Um, which is the equivalent of like thousands of atomic bombs all going off at once. So it would have killed all the dinosaurs nearby. But the real problem was actually the, the long term impact it had. <clears throat> so where it fell, it landed on a type of rock that's filled with what we call sulfur, which you might have heard of in chemistry and stuff. So sulfur then went into the atmosphere um, and it mixed with rain and it turned into a kind of acid and it fell as acid rain. And the problem is that, of course, because it was so high in the atmosphere, this cloud went around the whole globe. So not only did the cloud block out the sun, but then they had this acid rainfall as well. And that killed a lot of the plants. So, of course, if you think about all these giant, you know, sauropod dinosaurs and things, they need to eat a lot of plants to survive. So with all the plants dying, they died out. So then, of course, the meat eating dinosaurs didn't have enough food. They died out. And there was this knock on effect and basically lots and lots and lots of animals began to die out um, and it, it became this mass extinction. And we always think about the dinosaurs being the main ones that died out, but lots and lots of other animals did too. Everything from um, ammonites that I was just talking about, those spiral shells, they all died out as well. But also, of course, marine reptiles. So things like Nessie, you know, plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, ichthyosaurs, they all died out. And the flying reptiles, so, uh, you know, pterosaurs, um, and they all died out as well. So it was a really, really mass extinction. And also lots of mammals actually died out too. Some of the really early groups that had evolved alongside the dinosaurs. But as we know, of course, some mammals survived and also some dinosaurs in the form of birds, they survived as well. So when we talk about this extinction and we talk about how it wiped out the dinosaurs, of course, it didn't wipe them all out. We have still got birds and birds are really, really successful today. Uh, there's thousands of species. I guess in crocodiles and alligators, they're dinosaur like as well, aren't they? So they're, they're uh, cousins to dinosaurs. They're, they're not as closely related. Um, but actually, yeah, there was a lot of different types of crocodiles. In the time of dinosaurs, you had like uh, sprinting crocodiles, really fast moving ones. There was even plant eating crocodiles. Um, but yeah, a lot of them became extinct as well. Uh, so it, it had a huge impact on life on Earth. And really it changed everything because before this asteroid hit, of course, the, the world was really full of dinosaurs and they were the biggest, the kind of... Uh, most, what, what would the word be? I don't want to say dominant, but they really were kind of one of the biggest, most important parts of the world. 
Um, and of course, that's all been rearranged. And now there's a lot of birds, but mammals are really the kind of big animals. And we've got, mm -hmm. you know, of course, things like whales and elephants and gigantic big creatures, um, which you just didn't get mammals that big in the time of dinosaurs. Hmm. Um, somebody else is asking, what's the biggest thing you've found? So, uh, yeah, that was that bone from the Isle of Egg was actually the very biggest thing. Um, so, as I say, that was like the length of my arm. But actually, another uh, uh, another really interesting thing is what's the smallest thing that I've ever found? Because I think we forget that some fossils are absolutely tiny. Now, the very smallest fossils are actually um, so small that you don't realise that they're even fossils. So sometimes uh, rock that you'll find that makes up, you know, just the rock that makes up buildings and things like that is actually made of millions and millions of tiny, tiny little fossils, usually of little shelled animals uh, that float in the sea and feed on, you know, for example, uh, the sun's rays, they photosynthesize. But the smallest animal that I found that's a vertebrate animal, so that's an animal with a backbone, like my cat, who you may see in the background has just sat up. Um, so the smallest one, the smallest animal with a backbone that I've ever found uh, was, let me think, probably one of the lizards that I found because they are, I mean, some of them are really tiny. I mean, little things like this, about no bigger than your thumb. The whole animal would no, not be any bigger than your thumb. So they're very little and that makes them really hard to find. So, so what's the rarest one you've found? Oh, everything I found is pretty rare. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The rarest thing, that's a very good question. Is it like, would it be so rare I, that you're the first person to find that species or, or that type of dinosaur? Well, that's that's a really good question. So there's something which, if it's what I think it is, it's extremely rare and maybe the rarest thing I've found. And that is, um, so a couple of years ago, I got to go to South Africa to work with some uh, teammates who live and work in South Africa, looking for South African dinosaurs and also all the other animals that lived alongside them. And they're looking at rocks from even earlier, uh, the Triassic, so that comes before the Jurassic. So that's around about 200 million years ago, so really, really old rocks. Um, and we don't know a lot about the animals from that time period in South Africa. And um, we particularly don't know what a lot of the very small animals were doing. So one day, the person who's running the digs down there, the excavation, said to me, you know, Elsa, I want you to try and find really, really small things. So while everybody else was picking up great big, uh, you know, huge big backbones and things from giant, giant animals and putting them all in this massive pile, I was looking for tiny, tiny, tiny little things with my magnifying glass. And I found a whole bunch of stuff that looked like tiny little bones. But well, the problem is, I don't know yet what it was I found because it takes some time. You've got to scan them and then you've got to, you know, use that those scans to reconstruct them. So if I'm right and they are the bones of little tiny animals, particularly things like the salamanders and newts and stuff, then they might be some of the first that have been found from that time period in South Africa. So I've got my fingers crossed that that might be the case and we should find out in the next year or two. That was really exciting. exciting. Knowing yeah. you're the first person to find it, that's wow, that's cool. Yeah, well, this is the cool thing about looking for fossils is any fossil you found, uh, you know, it's been buried in the earth for millions of years and you're the first person to touch it, to look at it. Uh, that's really exciting. Yeah, cool. I want to become a paleontologist now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Miss Kinghorn is asking, how was a dodo preserved so well? Oh, the dodo, now that's a good question. So um, you might know that the museum I work in now in Oxford, we have the only preserved dodo um, skin in the world. So the dodo, uh, it, it's, it's kind of really famous for being extinct, but it became extinct really recently. It was only, uh, what, about 350 years ago, I think sort of mid 1600s. And of course it became extinct because uh, humans arrived on the island where it lived for the first time um, and they ate it basically. They hunted it and they ate it and they changed uh, the habitat that it lived in and it just couldn't survive. So we have this really, really rare bit of, um, of its skull with actual skin and everything on it. And the reason that there, there are so few um, remains is 
there's a couple of different reasons. One is that people just didn't think about the fact that it might disappear because they didn't understand what extinction was and that we could actually make something disappear forever. So of course they just they caught it and they ate it and they just threw away the bones and they didn't really think about it. Um, and only these very rare bits and pieces made it into museums around the world. And the other reason is that the island where it lived, it lived in places where um, you know the, the actual climate is quite hot and there's wet season and climates like that where it's hot and it's wet, they don't preserve bone very well. So the best places to find bones, you know, they, they vary from place to place. And um, so a lot of the bones of the dodos that did live there and, and died there, they basically just haven't survived, they've all rotted away. So uh, that's that's one of the reasons why it's it's so rare. I and mean, we know so little about it. And you might have seen if you Google the dodo, you'll see these great pictures of it and it looks kind of funny looking little bird. But we actually don't even know what it looked like. All of the pictures that we have, they tend to be painted by people who never actually saw one in real life. Because as I say, nobody thought to, to take a record of it. And of course, photography didn't exist. So people did some sketches and, and you know, wrote a little bit about it, but we don't really know anything about it. So it's quite, it's quite a sad story, but it's also really important that we learn from it um, so that we know not to let this happen, of course, to any animals at the moment that are in danger of extinction. We have to make do our best to make sure that the same thing doesn't happen to them. Yeah, I suppose if we just take pictures and, and write it all down, then whoever comes after us will know about all the animals we have, you know, because, yeah, because yeah, it's, yes, that's that makes sense. Um, have you ever found a fossil in Aberdeen or Aberdeenshire? I don't know. Oh, if we're... I'm afraid not. No, I haven't. Uh, there are fossils not that far from you, I guess. In I've looked for them in Elgin, which is not that far away. Mm -hmm. I mean, a couple. What's that? Two, two, three hours away from you. Um, and in Elgin, there's some really cool rocks from the Permian, which is just before the time of dinosaurs, and the Triassic, which is the very earliest time when dinosaurs started to appear. Um, and you get a lot of fossil footprints. So as well as bones, of course, you can also find footprints can preserve in the fossil record, which is kind of amazing because you think, you know, an animal just walks by and sometimes, you know, if we go for a walk on the beach, your footprints wash away immediately. But um, sometimes animals, of course, walk through an environment and then it may be the ground bakes really, really hard, for example. And then perhaps there's a flash flood or something and it fills in with some other kind of sediment, some other kind of rock. Um, and then it can preserve for millions of years. So there's these footprints and they're around about 250 million years old. So this is really unbelievably ancient. And they belong to some actually of our really ancient relatives. So creatures that um, don't even, they don't look anything like us. They don't look anything like mammals. They sort of look more like reptiles, kind of big bulky things. Some of them were uh, plant eaters and they were like the size of rhinos. Um, and had like crazy horns that came out of their faces and stuff. And then other ones were massive uh, meat eaters with saber teeth that used to feed on these uh, plant eaters. So it's a really cool time period actually. It's before the dinosaurs existed. Um, so yeah, it's called the Permian. You should definitely go and find out more about those animals. Cool. Um, Oin Primary are asking, what is the best beach in Scotland for finding fossils? I know, I think you can find some at Stonehaven. I think it's at the end of a fault line, but I'm not, ah. don't quote me on that because I'm not 100% sure about that. You might be right. There's actually a lot of beaches where you can find fossils. That's quite a difficult question to answer. I think you'll probably find that wherever you live, there's going to be places nearby that you can go and look. Um, so I would recommend uh, going onto, you know, going onto the internet and just looking it up. Uh, look up for fossils near me or beaches, fossil beaches near me and find somewhere uh, that's that you can get to quite easily because I couldn't really choose a best spot because um, they're I mean they're all brilliant and you find different types of fossils in different places so a lot of beaches you'll find um, for example south of Aberdeen I've been looking for fossils in Fife area of um, things that lived on the seabed even longer ago than the stuff I've been talking about so like so 400 million years ago that sort of time um, and there are things that look like corals um, and uh, you know stuff like that that lived on the seafloor. 
So you can find those. In other places, you find, of course, bones of animals like dinosaurs or mammals or something. So it really depends what you're looking for and what you're interested in. But definitely, uh, yeah, have a search online and see what you can find. But the most important thing is to make sure that if you go looking for fossils, that um, you know you check that you're actually allowed to take them if you find them, because uh, there's you know there's a lot of laws protecting fossils because we obviously don't want people to damage them. Um, and of course, if you find something really important and really interesting, you've got to tell a scientist, otherwise nobody will know about it. So if you go looking for fossils and you find something really cool, you can always take a photograph, send it to a scientist, send it to me, and they can tell you what it is. And um, they can also tell you if it's something really important. Because if you find a new species, you never know, you might get it named after you. That would be pretty cool. Can you tell if an animal was male or female by looking for it at its bones? Oh, well, that depends on the type of animal. And a lot of scientists will argue about this, about whether you can tell. So if we look at animals around us today, um, let's look at, for example, seals and sea lions. So you might have seen on nature documentaries that sometimes male seals um, are, like the boy seals, are enormous, uh, you know, really properly gigantic, or, and they maybe have like huge tusks and, and things like that, and that's because they fight with one another. Whereas the females are quite often a bit smaller. Now, of course, if they, if they are different like that, then we can tell from looking at fossils whether one is male or female. But a lot of the time, that's not really the case, or we don't have enough fossils to be sure. So um, a good example of that is an animal called Dimetrodon, which I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard of. Um, and it's, it looks a bit like a reptile, but it's not. It's actually one of our ancient relatives. And it had like a big fin on its back, a big sort of sail across its back. Now, some scientists argue that the um, male, the boy Dimetrodon, had bigger sails and they used them to like basically look bigger than their rivals and that the females maybe had smaller ones. But the problem is we haven't found enough fossils, so we can't actually be sure that that's true. Um, so that's one good example, but another one that everyone argues over is um, the stegosaurus. So I talked about stegosaurus earlier. And they've got these cool plates on their back, which I'm sure a lot of you will know about. So one of my, well, actually somebody I studied with, did my degree with, he argued that some, uh, some of the stegosaurs have rounded plates on their back and other ones have more pointed plates. And that that's actually the difference between boys and girls. Now, it's a really interesting theory, but it's quite difficult to prove. And there was other experts that totally and utterly disagree with him and think he's completely wrong. So they argue about it all the time. So it's very difficult to tell, but maybe, maybe sometimes you can. Yeah, I guess it's one of those um, tricky ones, isn't it? Um, until you can find another bones or something that's very similar, but slightly different, you'll never know. You can't do DNA testing, can you? Or can you on bones? Unfortunately not, no. So at the, like, of course, with Jurassic Park and stuff, we all kind of wish that we could get the DNA and analyze it. But at the moment, it looks like DNA doesn't last for longer than around about a million years at the very most. So I think, quite, quite old, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a long time. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but of course, you know, the dinosaurs became extinct 66 million years ago. Um, and the oldest DNA I think that we've got so far, now they got a really old one recently. I can't remember how old it was, but it's, it's hundreds of thousands of years. So it's not even a million. So, of course, that means we can't get DNA from dinosaurs. But you never know, maybe in a hundred or so years time, we'll have found some a way of doing it. Who knows? Yeah, I guess it's technologies. I mean, you think what it was even 20 or 30 years ago, technology's moved on so fast that there's no reason why not, I guess. This is the thing is I like, I never say never because I'm all, you know, it's shocking what, what scientists can do and they come up with incredible things. So even if we maybe can't read a whole DNA from a dinosaur, we might be able to tell something else. Uh, some people say that you can look, for example, at proteins. So, you know, some of the building blocks of, of cells and stuff like that, um, of dinosaurs. But it's, you know, it's very early days. I'm not really sure that that's, uh, that's, that we'll be able to tell very much from it. 
have you ever found a fossil um, from a well-known dinosaur like a T-Rex or a Stegosaurus or? Well, the only one is that one from Egg. So we, it's a Stegosaur-like dinosaur, but I've never found, uh, no, I've never found a T-Rex. So Tyrannosaurus Rex, of course, is from North America. So we wouldn't find them in the UK. But um, you do get something called Megalosaurus, which is really closely related um, and looked very similar to Tyrannosaurus. And it's not impossible that I might find one of them one day because they did live in the UK in the Jurassic. So hopefully one day. One of these days, yeah. yeah. Um, have you ever had a fossil named after you? No. No, I haven't. Not yet. I would love that to happen. That would be really exciting. Usually, uh, fossils get named after people when they're, um, they've been, like, for example, if I'm still a scientist in 50 years, then maybe if I'm lucky, someone might name one after me. Usually, you don't tend to get them named after you when you're just at the start of your career. The other thing is, you can't name a fossil after yourself if you're the person naming it. So that's actually one of the rules. You're not allowed to. So if I find a fossil, I can't call it, you know, Elsasaurus, but I can name it after someone else if I want to. So, uh, you know, I could call it Techfestosaurus, for example, if I wanted to. We would like that. That'd be really cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Somebody put in, one of our pupils has an interest in Predator X. Have you ever studied Predator X? I have no idea what this is, so I hope you do. <laughs> I have not studied Predator X, no. Now, am I right in thinking, is Predator X, uh, hang on, I'm just going to look it up, because is that not from, uh, oh, no, wait a minute, what is Predator X again? Oh, yeah, so that's the giant marine reptile. I have not studied that, no. Um, so it's not a dinosaur, but it's a, it's sort of a, a cousin, a distant cousin that lived in the sea and was absolutely gigantic. Um, I haven't studied it, but I do have some friends who study marine reptiles and they study things like Predator X. So I get to hear what they find out about them and it's it's pretty cool, pretty exciting stuff. Cool. Um, have you ever found a human bone from the dinosaur period? So no, so humans actually are really, we've only been around for a very, very short amount of time. So in the time of dinosaurs, there were mammals but they were nothing like us. They, some of them we were related to, they are ancient, ancient relatives, but they were not at all like humans. They would have looked more like uh, cats or, or squirrels or mice, you know, they were quite s relatively small. The biggest ones were you know, no bigger than a dog. Then after the, most of the dinosaurs became extinct and only the birds survived, after that point, that's when we get all of the groups that we know today. So cats and dogs and whales and horses and cows and things like that. But even then, it's millions and millions of years before humans appear. So our ancient, ancient relatives, they also begin to appear in the form of like monkeys and stuff um, in the last 50 million years. But then even then, of course, you know, they don't look like us at all. Um, and it's really not until about two million years ago that we have proper like humans that look look and think like us um really just in the last couple of million years and possibly even more recent than that because we find the bones of ancient humans but we don't actually know if they could just you know if they could speak did they have a language we don't know if they had art until quite recently really only hundreds of thousands of years ago rather than millions so humans have been around for like no time at all um, so no, we didn't live alongside the dinosaurs. I don't think we'd want to though. So, you know, I think, no, <laughs> I think that'd be a scary, dangerous, <laughs> a dangerous business. I'd love to go back in time and see a dinosaur, but I think I'd be a bit worried because it'd be pretty dangerous. Yeah, they're a bit bigger than us, I think. Um, oh yeah. Somebody's asking, in fact, there's two or three questions coming along the same subject. What was your favourite subject at school and what subjects did you choose and why did you want to become a paleontologist? So I'm sorry, it's three questions in one. No, that's a really, really good question, though, because when you ask uh, paleontologists, you know, when they wanted to become a paleontologist, a lot of them say they knew they wanted to be one since they were kids. And actually, I didn't. When I was, um, well, when I was in school, when I was in primary school, I did really like dinosaurs, but I didn't think I would study them because I just didn't think that that was something I could do because I didn't know that we had dinosaurs in Scotland. So I just thought that wasn't an option. And actually in school, I was much more interested in um, art 
and English and poetry and I really liked all of those kinds of subjects and I was okay at science but I wasn't I wasn't the best in the class or anything you know um, and it, it really wasn't until much later I, when I went to secondary school again I mostly was interested in English and art and those kinds of subjects and I did best in those subjects and I did okay in science it was all right you know and it was actually later on that I decided, you know what, I think I'm actually really interested in, in the natural world, in studying animals and studying plants and climate and the world around us. And then I went back again to college and I studied science then and started to basically come down the path that I'm on now. And even then I didn't know I wanted to be a paleontologist straight away um, until I started looking at things in, in what we call deep time, so things millions of years ago. And then I kind of thought, you know, it's so interesting as a subject. And so I went from, uh, you know, studying conservation and, and the modern world, I then switched and started studying extinct animals. Um, so it took a long time to realize what I wanted to do. I think not everybody knows what they want to do straight away, but being good at subjects like, uh, like English and like art, is actually really, really useful. You don't have to be brilliant at maths and science. It helps, but you don't have to be brilliant at those subjects to be a scientist. Um, you just have to study really hard and not give up. So quite often, you know, I'm not very good at maths um, and quite often I do struggle to do things that involve a lot of maths, but you know, I just don't give up. You just have to keep plugging away at it um, and asking for help if you need it. Um, and you do, you get there in the end. I think that's the, the most important thing, isn't it? It's just if you've got a team around you, you all collaborate together and you can ask for help at any time. And you know, if you don't know the answer, somebody else might be able to help you. you know, that's just you it. I mean, we're, we're not, we can't all be geniuses. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's some people out there who I'm sure are like amazing at these subjects. And I work with some incredibly uh, talented and really, really smart people. Um, but, you know, I'm, I consider myself to be pretty ordinary but I just work really hard and, and try really hard. And, and when you work as part of a team, as you say, you know, you can all, you, you all get to do the thing that you do best. You can bring that to the team and you can all work together to, to study whatever it is that you decide to study in the end. Cool. Um, this is a very important question because I need to know the answer to this one as well. Do you believe in the Loch Ness Monster? <laughs> and this is well, very important. <laughs> Between us, okay, um, I actually lived for a long time on, on the shores of Loch Ness. So I used to spend a lot of time playing down by the water, down by the Loch Ness. And one day I heard something really, really strange when I was playing down there. It sounded kind of like you know, a really deep rumbling roar. And I don't know what that noise was, but I've always wondered if it might have been messy. I'm not 100% sure, so I can't I think I'm not it was. say for certain it could have been. Um, but I should say officially, as a paleontologist, I should point out that it's unlikely that um, it would be a marine reptile or something from the time of dinosaurs. And I'll tell you why. That's because Loch Ness is actually quite um, young in terms of like it existing. So it really was only carved out in the last so 10, 20,000 years by all the ice that moved across the landscape in Scotland. So if it was going to be a, like a marine reptile or something living in there from the time of dinosaurs, it would have to have survived for a long, long time in order to then live in Loch Ness. So the odds are stacked against it, but I did hear that really strange noise. That I'm not 100% sure. I think it was just hiding. I think it's definitely there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's who knows. <laughs> um, somebody else has wanted to know if you've ever studied fossils outside of the UK, like in Europe or the rest of the world. I have. So the fossils that I look at in Scotland, I have to compare them to other fossils around the world. So I do quite a lot of travelling, or well, not in the last year, but normally I would do quite a lot of travelling. So I've been to, for example, Germany where I've got um, friends that work in the University of Bonn and I've looked at their fossils and um, also China. So one of the people that I that taught me when I was doing my PhD degree 
Um, he's from China, and so I got to go and look at the fossils that they have there, and they have amazing fossils in China. I'm sure a lot of uh, people listening will know about the cool stuff that, that they find. Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, I also got to go to South Africa um, and study some of their fossils. And I've also been to North America, and including Canada, and looked at what they've got. And so every time I look at stuff, of course, I'm comparing all of these different fossils. And as you learn more and more, you begin to sort of just recognise what things are and whether something is you know, differently shaped from something else. And that tells us how they're related to each other. Have you ever found a raptor? I haven't. No, I haven't found a raptor. Uh, that would be a cool thing to find, though. Yeah, I'd imagine. What's your favourite dinosaur then? Actually, my favourite dinosaur is um, Parasaurolophus or Parasaurolophus, depending on how you pronounce it. So some of you might know this one. It lived in North America and it's one of the like duck bill type dinosaurs. It has quite a sort of wide mouth, but it has this huge crest that comes out of its skull, like sweeps really, really far back. And they think that it used that crest to actually make like a sort of deep booming uh, call, like it could it could trumpet, you know, kind of like uh, like well, like some sort of modern animals do. And I just I absolutely love that. I think that sounds so cool. These trumpeting dinosaurs, I can just imagine. <laughs> What's your favourite part of the job? That's difficult. Two things I really really do love doing field work. You know, being outside and working with my friends and learning from them and finding new things is always exciting. But I think I also um, I really like writing. So I do a lot of writing and I write books as well. I've got a book coming out, actually, about the origin of mammals. Um, and I, li I just like telling other people about the stuff that I found out because I find it so exciting. So a lot of my job is about writing, sometimes writing really sciencey things for other scientists to read, but I also write, you know, for just everybody to read about what, what fossils are and where they come from. So that's like my other really favourite thing to do is writing. Um, okay, can you take DNA from a mammoth? Totally changing the subject. Personally, I can't, but okay. yes, we have actually already done that. That's, so that's been done. Um, because mammoths are mammoths are quite unique. There's a few animals that lived uh, during the ice ages, and the their bodies. Some of them, when they died, they actually fell into like permafrost, which is ground that is is kind of permanently frozen, that you get in the north of the world. So in places like uh, Siberia and the Yukon in America, and this frozen soil it preserves not just the bones but it can actually preserve the animal's soft tissue so it's flesh and it's hair and things like that and of course if you have soft tissue it means that you can get dna so uh, mammoth dna has been uh, what we call sequenced so that's when you basically extract it you take it out and you study it and you can look at it um, and it it's told scientists lots of cool things so for example it's told them how mammoths are related to different types of elephant and it looks like they're more closely related to Indian elephants than other types of elephant um, but it can also tell them things like that they have evolved to be adapted to um, really really cold temperatures um, and it can also tell them what color they were um, and it looks like a lot of them were like very from a kind of chocolatey brown to sort of ginger colored so um, yeah it's pretty cool and you can do it for some other animals. They've done it for, um, I think they've done it for saber-toothed cats, I'm not 100% sure. And they've done it for horses, ancient horses, and other things like that. But of course, as I said earlier, you can only do it if you can get the DNA. And we can only do that for things that died out relatively recently. Cool. Um, somebody else asked, are chickens really related to dinosaurs? Oh, absolutely. So if you have like, some of you might have like pet budgies or canaries or lovebirds or something. I mean, those are basically, they are dinosaurs. They're not just related to them. They are their living descendants. So in what happened is in the Jurassic, some dinosaurs, um, they became quite small and they had feathers. And at that point, they probably at first didn't fly. They just flapped around a bit, maybe used the, the feathers to glide, stuff like that. But eventually those uh, dinosaurs became what we now know as birds. And the birds lived alongside the other dinosaurs at the very end of the time of dinosaurs in the Cretaceous. 
But then when there was the mass extinction, birds, uh, some birds, not all of them, they made it through along with the mammals. And we think it might be because of multiple things, because birds, because they have feathers, they are better able to um, cope when it's cold and there's bad weather and stuff like that. Also, birds look after their chicks, of course, you know, they, 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 what we call, we give them a lot of care, you know, so they look after them in the nest and they feed them. And of course, if, if times are tough, that means that the babies are more likely to survive. And it's possible that a lot of dinosaurs maybe didn't do that. Maybe they did things more like crocodiles where they have hundreds of babies and then they just leave them to their own devices, you know, leave them to get on with it. And if times are tough, those babies are more likely to, to not make it. So that could be part of the reason that birds made it through. Also, birds are warm-blooded as well, which we think might have helped them to, to survive. So yeah, if you've got chickens or budgies or whatever, or if you're just looking out and you see a bird, you're basically looking at dinosaurs. These are all dinosaurs. That's really cool. It is pretty cool. <laughs> it is. Um, have you ever created a 3D model of a dinosaur? No, I haven't created one myself. Um, but I work with someone uh, called Matt Humpage, who is an artist and he does what we call uh, 3D digital art. So he takes the fossils that we find and he basically makes them into 3D models. Um, and you can print those models out. And I do do that sometimes. I can send it to um, a printer and they actually make it into a printed out 3D object. Um, and the cool thing about that is that if I do that, for example, I said I find some really small fossils, tiny little things, I can send them to get printed out and I can print them out like 10 times the size that they actually are. And then you can really look at them, you know? So if you've got a tiny jaw that's only this big, you can print it out so it's that big. And then you can see all the teeth and the details of what they look like and stuff. Um, so it's a pretty cool way to study fossils. That'd be really good actually with the technology changing. I mean, you couldn't have done that 30 years ago, but now you can, and that's really good use actually, isn't it? That you can make it that bit bigger and all of a sudden you can yeah. see everything, you know, without a magnifying and, and glass. Exactly, and I quite often, I do visit schools um, or I, I before a lockdown and everything, and I would bring these prints with me. So of course people can actually, you can touch them and handle them. And of course, they're, because they're printed and they're not the real fossil, it doesn't matter if they get broken. So it's much safer to handle as well. So maybe in the future, if I'm visiting any of these schools, any of the, you know, your schools, I might bring some with me and you can have a look. Okay, I'm conscious that we're running out of time a little bit here. Um, yeah. How much did Megalodons weigh? Oh, how much did they weigh? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Just a that's random such, question for you. That's such, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to Google it because I don't actually know. That's a really good question. <laughs> that's a really good question. How, how much did Megalodon weigh? I mean, it's gigantic, isn't it? I mean, it's much, much bigger than um, a white, great white shark. So if I can find this. I don't know. It's saying here that it weighed a thousand kilograms. So what I quite often do is I compare how much stuff weighs to an elephant because I find that that's a really good way to imagine how much something weighs. So and then you visualise it then, can't you? Yeah, an elephant can weigh around about well up to six thousand kilograms. So that's hang on, that can't be right. It must have been more. <laughs> Um, okay, I think we've just about covered all the questions. Um, okay, cool. Thank you, everybody, for putting it in the chat box. That was really fascinating. It was brilliant. I really enjoyed that. Can you come back again tomorrow <laughs> for more? Um, yeah, that was really good. Thank you so much for giving up your time this morning. Um, and also all thank the so schools much, for everyone. tuning in. It was just brilliant. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. And if anybody ever has any questions or wants to, to show me a fossil, they can always find my email online and, and send them to me anytime. Or send it in to us and we can pass it on if, if that's easier. Oh, yeah, of course. So, yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you very much for coming. And Elsa, just, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.